everybody, welcome to Trinity Church Online. My name's Jose, and I'm so glad that you're able to join us. Uh, today, uh, Pastor Chris is going to be finishing up the book of 1 Thessalonians. And as always, uh, after the service, stay tuned and uh, look at our announcements about the different ministries, how to get involved, and what we're doing. Um, and so now, let's just uh, take this time to open our service up with a word of prayer. Father, I just want to thank you again for this day. Thank you that we get to worship you and um, just uh, learn more and more about you through the word. And um, thank you for Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. And we pray that um, each of us gets to live out uh, our purpose in Christ according to your will. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For you, 
And I see a grave that is hollow of power And I see a battle that's already won And I see a church on the verge of revival And I see your kingdom has already come So do what only you can do Move what only you can move Even the impossible is possible for you You can make the chains come loose You can tell the mountains move Even the impossible is possible for you Even the impossible is possible for you You said it, and I see it. You still do miracles. There's power in Jesus' name. All darkness defeated. There's nothing stopping you, my God. There's nothing stopping you. But you said it, and I see it. You still do miracles. There's power in Jesus' name. All darkness defeated. There's nothing stopping you, my God. There's nothing stopping you. So do it only you. Move what only you can move. Even the impossible is possible for you. The chains come loose. You can tell the mountains move. Even the impossible is possible for you. Even the impossible is possible for you. You said it, and I see it. You still do miracles. There's power in Jesus' name. All darkness and defeated. There's nothing stopping you, my God. There's nothing stopping. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Trinity Church Online. Uh, we are going to be wrapping up our study in the book of 1 Thessalonians this morning. Uh, and so as we've been going through uh, the entire letter to the Thessalonians, the, the theme of the entire letter we've been looking at is this idea of certainty in uncertain times. The fact that, uh, you know, the, the Thessalonian church was struggling with the fact that they were going through persecution. That they were going through difficult circumstances. And so Paul was writing to them to encourage them uh, in, in what they can cling to during that. And the main thing that he focuses on throughout the entire letter is the return of Christ. The imminent return of Christ and how they are supposed to live in expectation of that. How are they supposed to live in light of that? And things along, along that line. And so as we wrap this up, uh, we've been talking the last couple weeks about our conduct. The fact that we can be certain that our conduct matters. And that was one of the big issues that we, we see. We've seen that throughout the history of Christianity. That if uh, Jesus died on the cross and paid for my sins, then why should I worry about what I'm doing or how I'm acting if I'm already forgiven? We talked a, a lot over the last several weeks about what our conduct is supposed to look like. And now... Paul, at the end of this, is going to kind of flip the script, and he's going to go back into this idea of what God is doing for us, this idea of sanctification. And we talked about that a couple weeks ago, several weeks ago, way back at the beginning of our study on the book of 1 Thessalonians, and uh, we looked at the difference between positional sanctification or positional holiness, the fact that 
uh, as, a, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you are made holy because, uh, or you are sanctified or set apart because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you. The fact that he died on the cross for your sins, he rose again three days later, his blood has paid the penalty uh, you know, for, for your sins, his sacrifice did that. And so because of that, when you place your faith and trust in him, you have positionally in that moment been made holy. It's something that cannot be taken away. It cannot be changed. Uh, but we also have this thing called practical holiness. And practical holiness is all about our actions and what we do and how we live our lives and li- trying to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord, trying to live a life that is uh, what we call, what we talk about walking in the Spirit. And so as we continue through this and look at this, the last little bit, Paul has been focusing on that practical holiness. Now he's going to jump back to the positional holiness and that idea. And so uh, when we talk about certainty and uncertain times, this morning we want to look at the fact that we can be certain that our sanctification is complete. That in the, the midst of all of the uncertainty in the world around us, if there's one thing we can cling to, it's that our position in Christ is certain. Our sanctification is complete. Uh, James Denny, in, in his commentary, in the Expositor's Bible Commentary on 1 Thessalonians, um, introduces this section by saying this, These verses open with a contrast to what precedes them, which is more strongly brought out in the original than, than in the translation. The apostle has drawn the likeness of a Christian church as a Christian church ought to be, waiting for the coming of the Lord. He has appealed to the Thessalonians to make this picture their standard and to aim at Christian holiness. And, conscious of the futility of such advice, as long as it stands alone and addresses itself to man's unaided efforts, he turns here instinctively to prayer. The God of peace himself, working in independence of your exertions and my exhortations, sanctify you wholly. Notice the comprehensiveness of the Apostle's prayer in this place. It is conveyed in three separate words, holy, entire, and without blame. It is intensified by what has at least the look of an enumeration of the parts or elements of which man's nature consists, your spirit and soul and body. It is raised to its highest power when the sanctity for which he prays is set in the searching light of the last judgment in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's go, let's dig into 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23, all the way to the end of the, uh, of the letter, verse 28. Here's what he says. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now, this is the benediction of this letter. This is the end. This is the wrap-up. And we're really going to focus this morning on those first two verses. And then the last couple of verses there, the last four at the end, uh, you really, we're going to allow them to, to be what they are. And those are those kind of like final instructions to the Thessalonian church specifically. But we want to focus on verses 23 and 24 today which says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. And so when we talk about the fact that our sanctification is complete, that from a positional standpoint, the idea that we have been saved, we have been set apart as holy to God because of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, when we think about what that means and how that can provide us with with some, uh, some encouragement during difficult times. Some, some kind of a pick-me-up when, when life is rough and when things don't, aren't going the way you think they should be going or you, you look around and you say, I don't know how much hope I really have right now. How can that fact provide us with, with hope? And so we want to look at four ways that our sanctification is complete and what that means. And so the first way we see right there is that, uh, number one, God is completely responsible for our sanctification, all right? And so that's, that comes out in, in one of the things that Denny says. And I read that little intro there to, to this passage. And one of the things he points out there, and one of the things that Paul points out, is that he just got done giving us a whole list of, of items that are that idea of practical holiness, how we live our lives, the, the, the way we conduct ourselves in our relationships with, with leadership of the church, with, with those around us. 
uh, you know, with the Lord himself. And how we talked last week about listening to the Lord, that response from him. And how do we actually hear from the Lord? And so as we continue to look at this, Paul throws this word in now. It's almost like he's using that to kind of, kind of just take his foot off the pedal and just redirect the conversation. He says, now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And so what we start with here is we have this idea of this, this prayer that Paul is praying. That's what a benediction is. It's that prayer that he's praying over the Thessalonian believers. And so he is asking God, he is asking that they uh, would understand that may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. So our first idea here, the way this can encourage us, is to remember that God's completely the one responsible for our sanctification. Uh, the word himself there in this sentence is, a, is this pronoun in the Greek is specifically designed to provide emphasis. And the emphasis that it's providing is to show us that it really is God himself who is the one doing the sanctifying. And so it's the kind of the difference between an active and a passive uh, verb when it comes to uh, the action, somebody doing the action, or somebody having the action done to them. And so for the Thessalonians' sake, the action that's being done, the sanctifying, is being done by God and to them. And if you were to remove the word himself from that sentence, uh, now may the God of peace sanctify you completely, you don't really lose a whole lot of the meaning of the sentence. But that when you throw that word himself in there, uh, that adds an emphasis to remind us who the person, who is doing the work. And so when, when Paul tells the Thessalonians, here's all these things you need to be doing. Here's how a, a, a believer is supposed to conduct themselves. Here's how you're supposed to live in light of the coming of, of Jesus Christ at some point when he returns. And, and what he's changing that pace is to say, here's the deal. You can do all that, and I can tell you to do all that, and you can try as, as the best you can to do all that, but at the end of the day, if you are not walking in a place where you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for your eternal soul, for your salvation, and, and he has not already set you apart uh, positionally, then the practical side will never happen. It is futile. It is, it is pointless to even try it because you're going to fall short when you do it on your own. And so the encouragement here is this idea that God is the one who is, who is responsible completely for our sanctification. And therefore, he is the one who enables us to pursue holiness and to, to strive to live a life pleasing to him, to strive to, to do what he asks us to do in his word. And so that's that first, that first thing. Hopefully that's an encouragement to you this morning as you think about this, that it's not up to you to determine that. That all you have to do is place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and you have been set apart and God is the one himself, he himself did it and, and it's done. All right? And that brings us to the second one. The second part of this, the second fact about what it means to be sanctified completely um, that, that are the, our sanctification by God is complete. And that is that that sanctification, he does it completely. He goes on to say, uh, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we get back into that word sanctify. Uh, John MacArthur talks about this. He says, uh, talks about the Thessalonians. He says they were saints because they had been sanctified. They had been set apart from sin, made holy in Christ Jesus. According to Scripture, every true believer in Jesus Christ, whether faithful or unfaithful, well-known or unknown, leader or follower, is a set-apart person, a holy person, a saint. In the biblical sense, the most obscure believer today is just as much a saint as the Apostle Paul. This is the believer's position in Christ. Holiness, in that positional sense, is not a matter of good works or holy living. As Christians, we should live holy lives, but holy living does not make us holy. To the extent our living is holy, it is because in Christ we are already are holy and have the counsel and the power of his Holy Spirit, which we talked about last week. We are holy because the sanctifier, or the one who makes us holy, which we just established, was God himself, has already sanctified us in response to our trust in him. Christ's work, not our own, makes us holy. We are saints by calling. That refers to the efficacious call of God to salvation. 
And then MacArthur comments about this prayer in 1 Thessalonians. He says this, Sanctification is the ongoing spiritual process by which God increasingly sets believers apart from sin and moves them toward holiness. The Apostles' entreaty for the Thessalonians parallels and reiterates the theme and form of his earlier prayer for their spiritual growth. And so as you kind of like listen to what he's saying there, it's interesting because he kind of gives both sides of that. There's this positional idea and there's this practical idea that we are incapable of pursuing God and, and striving to live holy lives if we haven't already been set apart uh, as holy by God because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. It's nothing that we've done. But Paul goes on even further to specify, and may your whole spirit and soul and body. Um, and some versions then will say be kept complete, uh, or be com- may your whole spirit, soul, and body complete, be kept blameless. Uh, the ESV puts the word complete a little bit earlier. But that word complete just literally means whole or holy. Not holy, H-O-L-Y, but holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, like entirely. And so that, that word means literally the whole lot. And it has the idea of the entire allotment complete in all parts and in no area wanting or unsound. The idea is that, is that which retains all that was initially allotted to it and is wanting for nothing in its holiness. The Greek word there uh, means without lack or deficiency. And so it, it was used of, of uncut stones, precious stones, as having lost no value and nothing at all when going through the process of being shaped and polished. And isn't that what God's doing to us? Isn't that the whole idea of sanctification? We talked about it several weeks ago, and the example that we used was being on one of those moving walkways in in the airport where you get on that moving walkway and you're going towards your destination. If you are walking towards that destination, then it's like you pick up speed without even trying because the walkway itself is pulling you towards towards the destination. And if you just stand still and don't pursue the destination, you still, even without trying, are inevitably being pulled towards that destination. And that's the difference, you know, that's kind of how you can kind of fit together the idea of practical and positional sanctification. And so here, what we look at this, what is God doing to us? He is shaping us. That once we become believers in Jesus Christ, he is constantly working us and shaping us to, into the, the image and into the, the form that he wants us to be. He is making us holy. Not just set apart for holy already because of Christ, but now he is making us holy in our lives and, and making us more like Christ. And that is that picture, and that's what this word means, that we are complete, that we're not lacking anything, and we're not losing any value as we go through that shaping process. Now, by the way, sometimes that shaping process is painful. Sometimes that shaping process is difficult. Sometimes we don't understand it. But we are called to trust that the Lord has our best interests at heart in what he is doing in our lives, that he is working to sanctify us completely, wholly, there's actually two New Testament verses, uh, only two, that use this Greek word. This is one in 1 Thessalonians 5. The other one's actually found in James chapter 1. And in James chapter 1, uh, you know, it's, it's in his exhortation when he's talking about, um, you know, count it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter trials of many kinds. And he says, and let endurance have its perfect results, that you may be perfect and complete. And there's that word complete, lacking in nothing. All right, And so the definition, according to James right there, is that idea of lacking in nothing. The idea is to be complete in all and every respect. And that's what God is doing in our lives. And he's already accomplished the positional side of it. And now he is working to, to make us more like him, to make us more like Christ. And so we can take heart in that, to know that God is at work in our lives. He's at work in our hearts. And as Paul says to the Thessalonians, May your whole spirit and soul and body. He is essentially saying, God is not just taking a piece of you. God is not just taking one part and leaving the rest. He's not just saying, okay, this part's good and this part's not good. I'm, I'm going to get rid of this and I'm going to take this part of you. No, he's saying, I, I'm, he's taking the, our enti- all of us, our whole being, and he is shaping it into what he wants us to be. And that's the specific, you know, you get into some issues with this idea of dichotomy and trichotomy if you're a, uh, uh, you know, into theology conversations. And, and most commentators will say that this 
passage really isn't talking about trichotomy that spirit and soul are different. What Paul's really trying to, to impress upon the, the Thessalonians, it, it goes back to what we said at the very beginning of this book. What they were, this letter, we started going through it you know, way back a couple months ago. And, and that's this idea that what was happening around the Thessalonians is they were dealing with a lot of, of uh, Gnosticism. And one of the beliefs of the Gnostics at that time was that every, anything of the flesh, anything of the body or physical was evil and only the spiritual was good. And so Paul, by saying this, would have really thrown a wrench into that kind of thinking when he's talking about God redeeming spirit and soul and body and keeping all of those blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's that, that second thing that we can look towards. That brings us to the third one. The third one, the, the third fact here that we can look to and find encouragement from in this idea of, of the completeness of our sanctification is that God preserves his work of sanctification completely. God preserves it completely. He's the one doing the work. Uh, it's a complete work. And he then preserves that work, not just partially, but completely. Uh, the word preserved that's found there, uh, as he says, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless. Some versions say preserved. The Greek word there means to keep an eye on, to keep something in view, to attend to carefully or to watch over it. It conveys the sense of protecting Watching over and guarding something which is in one's possession. To watch as one would some precious thing. It means to observe attentively, to keep watch over, and to retain in custody. And so the question that I would ask you after hearing the definition of that word is, do you believe and do you think that if, the, if Paul is telling the Thessalonians, then he is praying that God would keep them, all right, that he would watch over them, that he would keep them and hold them in his possession, that God is not going to lose his attention. All right, God's not going to drift off because he gets distracted by something else. All right, he's not like, like, the, like us. He's not like me. My ADD kicks in, and I'm sitting there talking about something, and all of a sudden I'm worried about something that's happening over here, or something that's happening over here. And the next thing I know, I can't figure out what I was doing when, when I was starting it. Or I don't know if you guys are like me and you lose things. I lose things all the time, and I don't realize I set them down for the express purpose of not losing them, and then I lose them in the place that I set them down at because I forget that I set them down somewhere. You know, there's probably plenty of people that can relate to that. That's not how God is, all right? God is not going to lose those that he has chosen. God is not going to misplace us. That when, when what Paul is saying here is that he is going to, he's, go, he's the one doing the sanctifying. It's not up to us, it's up to God, so we can, we can find encouragement in that. It's a complete process. He's not going to stop halfway. He's not going to just give up because, oh, this is too difficult. This person, is, he's got too many blemishes. Let's throw him back. That doesn't happen. And now what we can understand is that he's not going to lose us. God is paying attention. God is watching over us. He is keeping us. And therefore, if he is paying attention, there is no way that he is, his attention is going to lapse. There's no way he's going to misplace us. There's no way he's going to lose us. And so we can find uh, you know, some, some comfort and some encouragement in that fact. It's not up to us to keep ourselves holy. God is the one who is doing the keeping. And he goes on, that word blameless, to be kept blameless. That word there, uh, it, really, it, it means irreproachably or faultlessly. Uh, the noun here describes that which is without defect or blemish and thus describes not being able to find fault in someone. Uh, the idea is that the person is such that he or she is without the possibility of rightful charge being brought against them. Uh, this word was used in the Greco-Roman world of people who were characterized by extraordinary civic consciousness. And then it goes on, it's actually uh, you know, an, an adverb here that Paul uses earlier in, the, in this letter, in chapter 2, uh, to describe the life of himself and his companions, uh, Silas and, uh, and, and Timothy, as they conducted themselves while they were with the Thessalonians. Uh, and their conduct was such that there was no legitimate ground for accusation, even though there were accusations made against them, because if you remember our background on this, on this book and, and the, the, the writing of 1 Thessalonians, the, the people of Thessalonica that were not believers, they rose up and in, 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 in had you know, issues with Paul teaching and doing what he was doing, and they actually drove him out of the city. 
and they tried to have him arrested and, and all kinds of things. Then they actually followed him to the next city over and drove him out of that city. All right? But the, the charges didn't stick because of Paul's conduct. All right? And, and so that's that idea of being blameless. And so the adverb there is the very word, actually, that archaeologists, and we talked about this, I believe, when we talked about 1 Thessalonians 2 as well, that they found on ancient tombs in the city of Thessalonica. It was such a prominent word to the Thessalonians because of the way Paul used it that when people wanted to identify a deceased friend or a loved one as a Christian, they inscribed a memptos, which is the Greek word for blameless that is used here, on his or her grave. And so the idea here is not that we would be blameless. It's not that you're not going to make mistakes. It's not that you're not going to mess up. You're not going to fall into sin here, here or there and, and, and do something that's going to offend somebody or going, do something that's going to, uh, you know, to, to, to cause a relationship to, to fracture and have to try to repair it. And you know, we, we all make those mistakes. We all have that, that stuff in our lives. We are still battling that. That's part of the process of that practical sanctification we've been talking about. But what it does mean is that we can trust that God is the one keeping us blameless in the sense of there will be a time where those accusations will be brought against us, but they will not stick. And the reason for that is because we will be standing before Jesus himself. We will be standing before the judgment seat. And when the accuser brings those accusations against us, the reason they will not stick has absolutely nothing to do with you or me or anything we have done, but only because, as we've been talking about, God himself is doing the work. He has done it completely. It's a complete sanctification. And in this case, he keeps us blameless until that day because then that day comes and we are standing before him and we, we hear the accusations made against us in our minds. We're going to think, you know what, I'm guilty. I did that. I thought that. I said that. And then what's going to happen is Jesus himself is going to stand up and say, you know what, yeah, he did that. He said that. He thought that. But here's the deal. I went to the cross for that. And that penalty has already been paid by my blood. That, and we will realize at that moment that we have been, since the beginning, set apart, and we have been sanctified and made holy. This can be, should be a huge encouragement to us, because you know what it means? It means that we can't mess up at the last minute and, and, and you know, just, just completely destroy our chance of eternity. I mean, isn't that kind of a, a big concern if you think that, hey, you know, what if I make a mistake in the last seconds of my life or the last moment before Christ returns and then I'm forever going to, to lose what I thought I had? Well, if Jesus, God himself is the one who does the sanctifying, if it's complete and if he is the one responsible for keeping us blameless until that day, completely body, soul, and spirit, um, then guess what? I had a friend um, in college, she was in a, a pretty bad car accident, and he had some other people in the car, and, and as he was, uh, he was driving, he, he made a turn, and he got kind of hit, broadsided, and the car actually flipped, and while it was flipping, uh, he told me later, he remembers um, letting out a, an expletive as it was happening, and then it was almost, he said it was almost like slow motion, where as it, the car is rotating in the air, he remembers thinking to himself, man, that's the last thing I will have said before I see Jesus face to face. And luckily, he, he was fine, and he walked away without any injuries at all. I mean, it was really kind of amazing. But I just remember him, him saying that and thinking, you know what? I am so grateful that I can't mess this up. That it's about what God has done for me. It's about what Jesus did for me, not what I can do for him. And because of that, I, I can't mess this up. And that brings us to the fourth thing. And the fourth thing, this should be the, the ultimate when it comes to encouragement in difficult times, is, is this. God finishes his work of sanctification completely. So it is about God himself doing the work. It's a complete work. Uh, you know, he is the one who's going to keep us until that day when we see Jesus face to face. And God has promised to finish the work that he started. And it's in verse 24. He who calls you. Basically, Paul's like, hey, I'm praying for this, and by the way, I'm going to prove to you right here in this sentence that what I'm saying, what I'm praying for is going to happen. It's not just hope, it's certainty. And he says, he who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. That word faithful is, it means something or someone who is worthy of faith or keeps promises, and it is applied to God, humans, and his word at various times throughout the Bible. Uh, some examples 2 Timothy chapter 2, we find it twice. In verse 13, 
He remains faithful, meaning God, for he, God, cannot deny himself. All right? It is a, uh, verse 11, a little bit earlier, it is a trustworthy statement. It is a faithful statement. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. Or how about Hebrews 10, 23? Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And then in 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, you know, we think of the famous verses, uh, you know, one of which in Lamentations, we have a, a very famous hymn based off of, Great is thy faithfulness. His mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. This idea that we can trust God for today, because, and don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow, we can trust God tomorrow when we get to tomorrow, because he is faithful, and he will continually provide for us day by day by day by day, even though you and I want all of his grace right now in one big giant bag so we can just kind of divvy it out. It's kind of like the Israelites in the desert when they were being fed, and they were told, you know, don't just gather up enough for today because they were being called to trust in God's faithfulness that he would then tomorrow provide for tomorrow. And then, I love the phrase, he will surely do it. Some versions say, will bring to pass. Uh, The Greek word there just simply means this, God will do it. God will do it. Charles Spurgeon talks about God's faithfulness this way. He talks about, um, you know, an old Scottish believer um, and responding to the challenge of her pastor regarding the ground of her confidence in Christ. Uh, the minister said, Janet, what would you say if after all he has done for you, God should let you and allow you to drop into hell? Janet's answer, even as he likes, if he does, he'll lose more than I will. At first sight, Janet's reply looks kind of irreverent if not something worse. As we contemplate it, however, its sublimity grows upon us. Like the psalmist, she could say, I on your word rely. Uh, If his word were broken, if his faithfulness should fail, if that foundation could be destroyed, truly he, meaning God, would lose more than just his trusting child. Think about that for a second. But that could never happen. Forever, O Lord, Your word is settled in heaven, your covenant as faithful and true, and therefore bound and engaged to present you, the weakest of the family, with all the chosen race, before the throne of God, and in such a sweet contemplation you will drink the juice of the spiced wine of the Lord's pomegranate and taste the fruits of paradise. If you can believe with unstaggering faith that faithful is he that called you, who also will do it. Don't you love that, that picture there? I mean, what kind of faith does it take to say, hey, what would, it, what would you say if at the last moment you realize God's just going to let you d- drop into hell, despite everything you believed? He's just going to let you. And her response, if he wasn't faithful, if God wasn't faithful, and he wasn't going to follow through on his promises, her response was, then he will lose more than I will because he will lose the very nature of who he is as God because God is faithful. It's one of his attributes. So he can't not be faithful. And so we can cling to that promise that God's going to finish and complete the work that he started. Spurgeon also has a devotional on 1 Thessalonians 5.24. It's really interesting. It's very simple. He says, what will he do? He will sanctify us wholly. He will carry on the work of purification till we are perfect in every part. He will preserve our whole spirit and soul and body blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will not allow us to fall from grace, nor come under the dominion of sin. What great favors are these? Well may we adore the giver of such unspeakable gifts. Who will do this? The Lord, who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, out of death and sin into eternal life in Christ Jesus. Only he can do this. Such perfection and preservation can only come from the God of all grace. And why will he do it? Because he is faithful. Faithful to his own promise, which is pledged to save the believer. Faithful to his son, whose reward it is that his people shall be presented to him faultless. Faithful to the work with which he has commenced in us by our effectual calling. 
It is not their own faithfulness, but the Lord's own faithfulness on which the saints rely. Come, my soul, here is a grand feast to begin a dull month with. There may be fogs without, but there should be sunshine within. I hope that you're encouraged by this this morning. Maybe if you've been struggling, this is just kind of just solidifying your faith. Maybe if you've been down, this picks you up a little bit. Or maybe if you're, you're going through a time of a great season with the Lord, this just, just solidifies it, just, just builds upon it. But the bottom line is, he's doing a work in all of us. He did a work through his son on the cross. That work's complete. But he is moving us towards the destination, moving us towards the goal, the purpose of that work. And that work is in the process. And he does it himself. It is complete. It is, it is so complete. He will preserve us till the end. He will keep us, keep watch over us. He will make sure we don't fall off. And then finally, he is the finisher of what he starts because he is faithful. And he will surely do it, according to Paul. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to open your word, Lord. May, may what I've said be moved aside, Lord. May, may your word speak to our hearts. May your Holy Spirit move in our hearts this morning. And Lord, may you just encourage those who need to be encouraged with what we've talked about here this morning, with the, with the, the truth from your word. We thank you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, have a great week and remember as always, you are loved. So do what only you can do. Move what only you can move. Even the impossible is possible for you. Chains comes. You can tell the mountains move. Even the impossible is possible for you. Even the impossible is possible for you. Well, you said it, and I'll see it. You still do miracles. There's power in Jesus.